Welcome to the Nasher Sculpture Center. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and I'd like to welcome you all to our November 360 lecture featuring author Lawrence Weschler. To call Lawrence Weschler's essays thought-provoking would be an understatement. In art circles, he's known for his ongoing conversations with artists Robert Irwin and David Hockney, but he has also lent his engaging voice to topics ranging from Serbian politics to digital animation. Mr. Weschler is director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, where he's been a fellow since 1991. As staff writer at The New Yorker for more than 20 years, Weschler's journalistic work won a George Polk Award for cultural reporting in 1988 and for magazine reporting in 1992, as well as a Lannan Literary Award in 1998. Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonder, his book about the Museum of Jurassic Technology, was shortlisted for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Everything That Rises, a Book of Convergences, received the 2007 National Book Critics Circle Award for criticism. His latest collection, just out from Counterpoint, is Uncanny Valley, Adventures in the Narrative. And in addition to his gift for writing, he's also a delightful speaker. So please join me now in welcoming Lawrence Weschler. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, today's talk begins right after I graduated college. And I had a family friend who was a shrink. And he said, come over to my office and I'll do some tests on you and we'll figure out what you should do with your life. And I went and he gave me the whole battery of tests, including that 800 multiple, uh, double, I would rather be a fireman or an arsonist, I would rather be a rock or a feather, I, you know, 800 questions and then eventually the Rorschach test and all these things, and I was there for like three or four hours, and he said, come back in a couple weeks and we'll talk about it. So I come back a couple weeks later, and, uh, and he says, well, you know, the Rorschach test, we grade on all sorts of different indices, you know, we, we, you know on erotic, uh, eroticism, aggressiveness, you know, uh, this and that, and one of the things we graded on is general free associating tendencies. And since you were here two weeks ago, I have been calling people all over the world because your score in that regard is so far off the charts, nobody has ever seen a number like this. And this is not going to be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have a very, very hard time staying focused. Something that had been noted by my grandmother when asked what I used to study in college, she would say, nothing that will bring him any good. Uh, <laughs> and has been noted by my daughter in years since, uh, repeatedly, ever since she was four or five years old, she would say, uh-oh, daddy is having another one of his loose synapsed moments. But anyway, it's interesting because the first book I did after that, uh, in my life was the book I did with Robert Irwin, which uh, was called Seen is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees, and the new edition just came out, which brings it forward uh, consists of 30 years of our conversations, but, but the thing about Irwin was that his entire life work, and it was a passionate, deeply committed life work, was to stop free associating, was to stop having any associations at all, to just be able to look at something, to see it, so that when I hold this up, if you were to see it the way Bob sees it, you would not be aware of it being water, plastic, you would see it, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. And for 30 years, our relationship has consisted of me saying, you know what that reminds me of? And him saying, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I don't care what it reminds you of. Can't you, just, can't you just shut up? Can't you just look at it? And, and in all seriousness, in, in some ways, my work with Irwin was trying to cure myself of this tendency to keep on associating. In retrospect, I kind of think we, we are similar uh, in that we just do it opposite ways. I mean, Irwin, in a kind of Zen way, acknowledges every single thing and, get, and, doesn't, and lets it go and go through him. And I just have to say it and get it out of me, and then we're ba both able to look at the same thing. But he would never agree to that. And in any case, it was a failure. It didn't work. And from then on, I've been doing these sorts of things where I'm constantly free associating. And it culminated in a series I did in McSweeney's magazine over the last 10 years of convergences where I would take two things that you wouldn't necessarily think of side by side, the rhyme of them, and then I would kind of write an essay around that as if the, the 
the, the two things, and it can, by the way, be two poems. It can be a painting and a poem. It can be a, a, a painting and a poem. It can be two paintings. It can be a TV show and a politician. I mean, it, all kinds of possibilities. But once you have the the rhyme, you then have to make something of it. So, for, just to give you some example, we have got, we eventually collected all those in this book called Everything That Rises, that was put out by McSweeney's, and to give you a sense of how that book works. For example, at one point I have these two images, 1952 Jackson Pollock, 1952 Time Life books, Colliding Galaxies. And what's interesting about that is that when those paintings were first being shown, all the critics used imagery, nebulous, uh, neb like nebulae, galactic, that all, uh, you know, like, like galaxies in collision. There were all that kind of language. One of my favorite things that was said in 1952 about Jackson Pollock is that the paintings are so silent. Duh, they're paintings. Uh, but, 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 uh, but what people mean, I think, is that they are so explosive that their silence resonates, and even more to the point, that they feel like you're in outer space, like you're in the vacuum of outer space. It's that kind of silence. Um, it was something that was added to by Pollock's very th theatrical gestures. He would have himself photographed like a god. Uh, the, the canvas would be on the ground, and he would be th throwing skeins of paint like galaxies into, into the universe and so forth. So that was, that was fairly common. But I then, in the same piece, started talking about Rothko, because, you know, Rothko is you can go to Rothko lectures and you basically often get this sort of progression where you start with, uh, with these, I mean, you start earlier, but then the, you choose these incredible color forms, these gorgeous uh, clouds of color, one on the other, the, uh, the almost totemic. Uh, they, 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 they look right through you. They're incredibly powerful. And they get darker and darker over time. And... You can almost hardly not see this one, but if you go to Houston, this is the sort of thing you see in the Rothko Chapel. And then at the very end, in 1969, he's, paint, he's gotten to the point where he's painting things like that. And generally, when you're taking a lecture, a lecture on Rothko, what they'll tell you is uh, he's a few months away from committing suicide there, and you can already see it, and so forth. Um, which is true as far as it goes. And by the way, I've always had trouble with Rothko lectures uh, with the slide carousel, God knows, with PowerPoint, because because the paintings themselves would object to being rifled through that way. Uh, they would literally, uh, they would object. They would be objects, but, they, but, but the, if ever there are paintings that force you to look at them one at a time, and in fact force you to just leave the museum after you've looked at them, uh, it's these paintings. And so when you see this kind of da-da-da-da-da, it's kind of problematic. Having said that, I once went through an entire Rothko show which had that progression, and it was getting darker, and then it got to that, and indeed the last thing is now he commits suicide. But I happened to look at the date on the painting, which is 1969, summer of 1969. And what was on TV in 1969? And I'm not saying, and I, I want to be clear with all these things, that I don't mean to be reductionistic. I don't mean to say that Rothko got his last imagery from what was on TV. But I do invite you to imagine what it would have been like to be Rothko that terrible last summer as this incredible achievement happens. I mean, this absolutely mind-boggling, really epical achievement of man getting to the moon, you know, and, but when he gets there, what's there? There's nothing there, you know. I always used to think at the time that, that you would know you were on the moon if you could tell it was daylight because the ground was shining. Um, but, but when you're actually in front of this at a museum, it really does have the same kind of shadings and so forth. It's quite, uh, quite astonishing. Anyway, uh, generally speaking, by the way, I have two things I say about these convergences. First, I don't mean to redu be reductionistic, and secondly, take them or leave them. You know, if you don't like it, okay, never mind. Uh, uh, they, they can get deep, but they can also be fairly light. Anyway, so another time, for example, in the book, uh, somebody, a friend of mine in Chile, showed me this book of landscapes of Venezuela, of all places, uh, and... Immediately, when I turned that page, I said, oh, my God, look at that. That's the Rokeby Venus. And then I said, actually, it was even weirder because if you see, in the book, you can see there's this path that's going along here. And I said, wait a second, that's not the Rokeby Venus. That's the Man Ray Lips. 
And they, wait a second, the Rokeby Venus is the man ray lips. Oops, I blew that. I, oh, let's go back here. Oh, you didn't see that. Don't forget that you saw it. But uh, if you look at this, look at the... And, and by the way, just look at this little corner over here, for example. Um, I really think that 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 is something that Velasquez was thinking about at the time. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And I really and so I began to think about this. This, by the way, is Man Ray's painting. In 1933, Lee Miller has just left him, so he's in despair, and her lips are are spread across the sky. Um, it's interesting the. The uh, title in French is Les Amoureux, The Lovers, but when you say lips in, in, uh, in, uh, in French, it's Les Lèvres, so the, Les Lèvres is The Lovers. Uh, but also, an interesting thing is what's going on here. That's the observatory outside of Paris, and I have, I'm pretty convinced that what that is, is that's a throwback to the fact that in the 1870s and 1880s, well, be, let me put it this way, before 1880, time was real, which is to say that the time in Dallas was whatever, the, it was based on noon being when the sun was at its highest point on the solstice, and Houston might have been 12 minutes different, and El Paso 12 minutes or 15 minutes the other way. And it was no problem, you would go on horseback, when you got there you'd check your clock, or your watch against the church steeple and everything would be fine. This became a problem with, with transcontinental railroads. And it was literally the case that the train from New York to Chicago, which stopped in 17 places, had 17 clocks on board. That it would go for an hour and 13 minutes and arrive at a place that was an hour and 27 minutes difference and so forth. And this became incredibly complicated. And they eventually had a treaty, uh, 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 which was the Treaty of Washington in 1884. And uh, the vote was 42 to 1 among the nations of the world to have Greenwich be zero degrees and have time zones based on that. The one that voted against that was France. And they, wa they, wanted, they wanted that to be zero degrees. And indeed it was uh, through, through 1918, French maps all had zero degrees and time zones at a different place, which was a problem when French travelers would go places and the time wouldn't be what the French map said it was going to be. But anyway, uh, but it seems to be that this is that this is a reference to zero degrees, that Lee Miller has left him, and and it is it is uh, it is that moment. Anyway, and so now I'm I've already given away my punchline, but I was becoming convinced that I was insane to think that these paintings and things were all related to each other, except that then I saw a book of Man Ray, who six months after after he had painted that painting, took a photograph. He put it in, over his bed, and he took that photograph. So I don't know. And then a really weird thing is that. The, this painting is, as I say, Paris 1933, and in Paris in 1933, Chagall did that painting. And, I mean, what's also interesting is that and that, it's, I don't know. Anyway, an, another example in the book is this Magritte uh, painting called Le Temps Duré, uh, the duration of time, it, clearly with a kind of Einsteinian undertone. And this photograph of an event, an actual historical event in 1895, where this train overran the Gare de l'Est, I've always been convinced that it was going on Greenwich time, I think is <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of thing you have happened. But, uh, but what's interesting is I'm convinced that Marguerite would have known this picture. And, and what's great about it, by the way, is how it really does look like a, I mean, this, this thing here and this thing here. It, it has that whole kind of feeling to it. What's interesting about the Magritte painting is, is it puts me in mind of the fact that, uh, that if you had happened to be a child prodigy uh, in 1884 who was, I guess, six years old, um, and everybody was talking about what time it is in Paris when it's such and such a time in London and how we can figure out what's simultaneous and what's not and, you know, and so forth and so on, you too might grow up to write, do a theory of relativity in which the main examples you use are trains and railroad tracks and lightning hits the tracks at two different places at the same time and how it's all relative to everything else. Anyway, the point is that I went on from there uh, to um, uh, do various other sorts of uh, things and eventually we published the book 
And we then had a convergence contest online, which is ongoing. There are now like 80, 80 iterations of people sending me things that they asked me to comment on. Uh, they themselves also, and I invite you to submit things. Uh, there have been all manner of things that began back in the Bush era, uh, and there was this submission, <laughs> which is Goya's uh, Saturn uh, and uh, and Saturninius Children and Bush. It then became, uh, there it turns out to be a, a, a veritable epidemic of this kind of problem in the world. Uh, this, this is happening everywhere. Uh, somebody else submitted this, which I like a lot. This is, this is a festival, a carnival on the West Bank, and these are all women in their veils. And over here we have a party, uh, the Ku Klux the Ku Klux Klan in Iowa in 1926 having a family outing, and they're all wearing their Ku Klux Klan things. One of my favorite ones was submitted by Walter Murch, the great film editor, and he did it. He topped everybody by submitting a convergence that was a single picture convergence. This is a photograph of clear cutting a forest in Sweden as seen from the air. And you can see why this would happen. Uh, they don't want either the roads to see what's going on, so they leave the trees up there and they leave the trees here, and then they get in, but once they get in, they really want to take everything out. And essentially, once you start seeing that, you start seeing these sorts of things everywhere. This is a delta in Africa. Um, so you see a lot of that sort of thing. You also, uh, th here's an example of a different sort of thing, which is this is a woman who's just uh, crossed the English Channel and the deposition of Christ. Uh, and again, this is not me, somebody else sent this in, but the, what, one of my comments was that at least uh, Christ didn't have to deal with the paparazzi. <laughs> Unless you think of the old masters as, as the paparazzi of the passion, you know, in which case you get all these flash shots of the crucifixion, of the, that's why you have a thousand of the, each of those images. Uh, so there it turns out to be an awful lot of Christological stuff going on in the contest. Uh, Somebody sent this, pic these two pictures. Uh, this was his father. There, there, I, I would think that almost all family albums of the 50s have this picture in them, in which somebody's putting up the clothesline or something, and it, they repeat the Iwo Jima image. But the more interesting question, and this guy was a, he said his father was a veteran and that we're doing that. There, Ed Keenholz famously did a version of this, planting a, uh, an American flag. Uh, in an in a, uh, outdoor uh, uh, backyard furniture place and so forth. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is about this picture here, and some of you now know this uh, from having seen the Clint Eastwood movie, but as you may know, this was not the first flag that went up at the top of Iwo Jima, and in both cases in the middle of the battle. The first flag the day before, the admiral in the bay shouted up, it was too, the flag was too small. Do it again. I want a better flag. And so they had to figure out some way to get a bigger flag up the hill. The battle is raging during this whole thing, and there are bullets flying while this is happening right here. But uh, so they eventually get a bigger flag up, and they do, do this. And there were 10 or 15 pictures taken that day of this as it was happening. There were thousands of pictures from other battles, from North Africa, from Europe, from the Eastern Front, from, uh, from uh, other battles in the Pacific. Uh, but this is the one that separately Editors of every newspaper in America chose this picture to put to put out in the front of their newspaper, and I think it has to do with, for one thing, a beautiful photograph. It's great, you know, great diagonals. It's it's on top of a mountain, and the GIs are are a mountain. I mean, it's very dramatic. There's all that stuff to it. But I would argue that the reason is because all the editors had been trained, had already seen that picture in this sort of picture. That there are thousands of paintings of the raising of the cross. And they had a kind of feeling they, and in fact what I'm trying to talk to you about through this whole lecture is how pictures present, prepare the way for the reception of other pictures. And we can't help but see things, Robert Irwin notwithstanding, uh, in the context of other things we've already seen. What this had the tendency to do parenthetically, it had a whole trail of associations in its wake because it turned the island hopping campaign, which culminated in Iwo Jima, into a Stations of the Cross. 
And th if this is the crucifixion, then it presages a resurrection in the life. It had all kinds of things. It gave meaning to a whole string of events that had preceded it, all in the flash of a picture. Anyway, so at one point, somebody sends me this picture, these pictures. Uh, Eric Fischel below, Paolo Uccello, the great early Renaissance uh, perspective artist above, and more specifically these two. And this guy's name was Benjamin Morris, I'll give him credit or blame, and he said, surely Fischel must have known about the Uccello and have that in the back of his mind. First of all, the Fischel, the Eric Fischel, uh, this is one of the Krefeld paintings. Uh, Krefeld Museum was once a, a residence uh, built by Mies van der Rohe. Is it in Germany or is it in Holland? I'm not sure where it is. Germany. That's why you have such a good director right there. You know, he knows everything. Anyway, uh, uh, but, but so in Germany, and one of the things they do is they, they have a, it's a modern art museum, contemporary art, and for example, it has a, uh, a, a Nauman. This reads, if you could see it, the true artist reveals mystic truths it has uh, Andy Warhol, Maryland. It has a uh, Richter, and in his case, they let him have the run of the museum for ten days with two actors, a man and a woman, who got to play out this this drama of dissolute, dissolution, horrible sexual politics, disastrous kind of scenes. He took two thousand two hundred photographs. He turned. Uh, uh, twenty of them or twenty five into paintings. This is one of those paintings. And this guy says that he must have had the Uccello in mind, and it is pretty startling. I mean, you look at the parquet floors in both cases. You look at this weird thing going on up here and this here. You look at uh, her and her. You look at the way that the stairs plus the shadows play out like wings, like dragon wings. Her, she's as if she were on a horse there. I mean, it is kind of striking. And so... By the time we got this one, I decided I really should try to figure out when something like this happens, what's going on? What am I trying to say? And this became the occasion for a exercise, which I now invite you to join me on. Uh, if you have that in your thing, you'll see on the back. Uh, what I decided to do, from here on in, it's kind of like one of those uh, butterfly collectors in the Victorian era who has drawers and drawers of butterflies, and I want to show you different kinds of, con when, I, when you see a convergence, what's going on? It goes all the way from one side to the other as a spectrum. It goes all the way from apophenia, which we'll talk about in a second, all the way uh, uh, to plagiarism and counterfeiture on the far side. But so just imagine I'm going to be opening drawers and just showing you my various collections here. And indeed, uh, the first one I want to talk about is apophenia. Have any of you heard that word? It's a great word. Walter Murch gave me this word. Apophenia is the tendency of human beings to see Patterns where there are no patterns. Wouldn't that be a great name for a band? <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll give you an example of apophenia. Um, and to do that, I have to get out of here for a second and go to here and go to here. Uh, this is a, I'm going to be showing you a scene uh, without the sound as it happens, from Godard's film, Two or Three Things I Know About Her. And her is the region Paris. And in this scene, the housewife, who is also uh, moonlighting or daylighting as a prostitute, uh, goes to a coffee shop, and she dips her spoon in the coffee and looks at the coffee. What you have to understand is in the old days, actually people here, I sometimes give this talk at schools, and I have to explain to students about going to movies you know, not watching them on your iPhone or on your iPad or even like this, and you go to a theater and the whole wall is a screen, you know, and not those little theaters where there's 25 theaters, and a whole wall, and you are in the movie, and it's a whole different experience. It becomes important in this particular case. Uh, anyway, I'll, sh I'll just show you here. Um, let's see. So you, there's some, there's some music. I'm going to move it forward a little bit faster. Uh, so she, there's the coffee, and she, and she uh, puts her down, and then she's looking at things, and then what the, what the, it, uh, Godard is just blathering in Godard way, so you don't need to know what he's saying. But the point is, I challenge you to look at that and not think of galaxies. 
not think of thoughts forming, not think of, you know, so forth. Uh, this is apophenia. Those are not actually galaxies. But, uh, and it gets even more amazing when you're in, the mo in a real movie theater and you get this. The whole world of the theater turns brown. And, and you get that. Whirlpools and, and the process of thought and the process of dreaming. I can give you any number of things, but the point is you can't, it doesn't look just like coffee. You are having apophenic reactions to it. And then it goes, even, then he takes it even further, and you get to. Is there anybody there who's not thinking of cells? And of, I mean, this is, you just, that's what you think of. Or egg, you can, well, the same difference. Uh, or mouth there, that was funny. Uh, anyway, the point is this sort of thing. So, uh, now watch this. Okay, you get the idea, right? I mean, it's kind of amazing. So, so that is apophenia. Um, we go back to this, and back to this, and to that. Um, in term, okay, let's see. Oh, I see. Okay. Under apophenia, there's different kind of categories, and one of them is projection. I mean, that one of the ways in which we see patterns everywhere is we project them, and that's obviously Rorschach tests, for example, are a good example there. There's the famous story of the guy who goes to the doctor and says, doctor, doctor, you've got to help me. And the doctor says, what? No, 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 don't even tell me what your problem is. We'll do a little experiment, and I'll tell you what your problem is. And I'm going to look at some cards. And the first card is two parallel lines vertical, and the guy says, oh, my God, that's disgusting. Disgusting. It's 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 two people and they're kissing and that's that's, that's just, they're kissing. That's just disgusting. Puts up t two parallel lines horizontally. Says, "Oh my God, that's oh God." It's two people and they're making love and that's just disgusting. Puts up the next chart. Two cross lines. Says, "Oh my God." And the guy says, "You know, we can stop right now. I can tell you what your problem is. You have a pathologically dirty mind." <laughs> and the doc and the guy says, "I've got a dirty mind. You're the one showing me the dirty pictures." <laughs> Anyway, uh, so that's, the, that's how projection works, and you know, I'm sure some of you think you see something there, but that's just in your mind. Um, anyway, um, and if you take that far enough, you get into paranoia, where you get rampaging projection, and in fact, single-minded projection, where you only can project in one way. For example, there was that movie with Jim Carrey called 23, um, in which every... Uh, Everywhere he looked, everything added up to 23, or divided up into 23, or he, and he's, and he completely gradually goes crazy. Uh, then there's uh, this here. Oh, wow, that's weird. This is my 23rd slide. <laughs> but uh, over here is a Tea Party person. I love this. This is, like, really wise. God and Obama neither have a birth certificate. <laughs> That's a, uh, you know, think about that for a while. Uh, or here we have a Spanish edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which purports to tell you that the Jews are responsible for capitalism, Masonic, Masonic, Ma Masonicism, uh, Soviet, you know, Christianity, communism, and Nazism. Uh, which in turn reminds me, when I was covering the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, uh, the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, one day during the break, I was sitting next to a Serbian nationalist reporter who you know, told me, took me aside and said, you realize that all of history is a conspiracy between the Germans and the Jews to do in the Serbian nation. <laughs> and I said, wow. I said, where does that put the Holocaust? He said, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? So, okay, 
we go from that, we go to accidents or coincidence, things you know, just are accidentally, uh, and that's, you start with chance and the shuffle of things. Uh, I mean, this was one day I opened The Economist, and this guy here seemed to have gone through this arch and show up over here. It's just weird. The answer to that is that the number of times that doesn't happen, you know, and statistically, sure enough, it'll happen sometimes. A little bit stranger was the uh, back page ad on, of Time magazine the week of that 9-11 happened, which was an ad for Lufthansa. And this was the following week. And you're going, hmm. <laughs> Bad advertising campaign. This is this in, this in Tiger Woods. Uh, but um, so another category of this kind of chance sort of thing is separated at birth. And this is the thing where it is true that Mick Jagger and Don Knotts look exactly alike. I don't quite know what to make of that. Or that Keith Richards and W.H. Auden look exactly like there. I think it's just something that happens to a certain kind of dissolute English person at a stage in their life. Uh, but what do you make of Charlie Watts and Buster Keaton looking exactly the same? Uh, except that it gets more complicated because Buster Keaton looks exactly like Samuel Beckett. Indeed, Samuel Beckett included Buster Keaton in movies that he made of some of his uh, short plays. And what's really weird is that one of Buster Keaton's greatest fans was Ludwig Wittgenstein, who also looked like that, so I don't know what to say. That's just weird. Sometimes, though, these things are a little bit more interesting, and I had one of them in my original book, uh, which is Newt Gingrich and Milosevic look exactly the same. <laughs> And uh, I have a, in the book, you'll see there's like a dozen examples, and you can't tell the difference. And, and what was even more, well, what's interesting, I, I call the chapter Pillsbury Doughboy Messiahs. Uh, and uh, Ed Colbert has taken to making, uh, to using this same sort of image. Um, what's interesting is that, that I made an argument that their careers were very similar, and I, I don't mean that Gingrich is a war criminal, but, but that. Uh, but that in both cases, they really don't believe anything. They're, in the case of Gingrich, he had, when he came up with his uh, contract with America, that had been focus grouped. He just focus grouped until he came up with a set of things that, were, that really sailed through a focus group, and then that became the thing he believed in. Uh, in the case of Milosevic, he was just this minor a uh, middle-level communist bureaucrat who certainly didn't care about Serbian nationalism, but one day he gave a speech and suddenly the crowd went crazy and he said, this is my ticket, and he did that. And in both cases in their careers, the true believers ranked behind them and went way further than they wanted to go and shut down government and, and in both cases led to calamities of, uh, of their careers. What's strange, though, is that there's, uh, in, the, in the years since I wrote that piece, which was something like 15 years ago, there's just been this outbreak of these Pillsbury Doughboy messiahs. You just start seeing them everywhere. <laughs> and there's the godfather of the Pillsbury Doughboy Messiah, Roger Ailes, uh, who has all these gorgeous women as his, when he doesn't have the Doughboy Messiahs, he has them. And Okay, never mind. Um, there's a history of Pillsbury Doughboy Messiahs. And so I called my friend John Hodgman and to ask him what he thought of all this, and he's, he didn't see what I was talking about. <laughs> so, anyway. so there's separated birth, there's transubstantiated in death, where you get this sort of thing, uh, where suddenly a stain looks like the Madonna, or, or, shows up on a, or the Madonna shows up on burnt toast, or Jesus. This was a really interesting one. This was in Australia, in a way, way, way out in the outback. Uh, there was a town of like 75 people, and suddenly the, the, in the, uh, the way the sun in the afternoon came through a tree onto this fence became uh, a sighting, and, and tens of thousands of people descended on this town. It was, a, it was an emergency. They had to truck in water and so forth because everybody wanted to see this, and it was becoming a huge crisis, and thank goodness the season changed and the leaves fell and the town returned to normal. Uh, Arguably, the Shroud of Turin is or isn't this sort of thing. It's not only limited to Christianity. On the eve of the uh, recent Gaza war, a sheep was born with the, with the word Allah in, in, in Arabic on its flank. It's not limited to religion. Uh, you have this sort of problem when Kate Moss shows up on a jelly bean. Uh, um, here's an interesting one. Um, 
On the first year anniversary of the death of John Paul II in Krakow, there was a bonfire, and somebody took a picture of the bonfire. Now keep in mind, this was not seen by anyone. A fire is flickering. So this photographer took this picture, went home, found it. It was on the front page of every newspaper in Poland and was sent to the Vatican as further proof toward the beatification that this was. And what was very weird at that moment was that Maurizio Catalan, the, the, the uh, artist who has a big show at the Guggenheim right now, had a show in Warsaw at, at, at that very time, which included his famous image of the Pope being hit by a meteor. Uh, and this caused a huge scandal and they had to shut the show down. This is a scandal. This is a proof of somebody of divinity. Uh, the, the Pope being on fire is okay, I don't know, anyway. And then just last week, I happened to see this, which is a solar flare, a photograph of a solar flare that was just published. I don't know about you, but. <laughs> anyway, so you get that kind of problem, and that's, that's uh, accident or coincidence. Then you get on to affinities. Affinities, now we're beginning to move over. We've come out of that room, and we're now into another room. And this is something that's where things have a kind of rhyme and people see the one side sees the rhyme or something, there's a kind of affinity. And this is the famous sort of thing that you saw with the primitivism show at, at, at MoMA years ago. Uh, in other words, at a certain moment uh, after, in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, uh, artists increasingly culminating with the Cubists become incredibly interested either in Japanese art or Chinese art or, or African art. Uh, the Cubists all hang out at the Anthropology Museum, the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, uh, and they, they feel it and they start copying, but it's not exactly copying, they feel an affinity. And I think arguably the affinity they feel is that after the invention of, of photography in 1840, of chemical photography, there's this kind of sense that photo you don't need painting anymore because photography can do it all. And one point, perspective uh, is, is possible to do everything. And as David Hockney has said, uh, photography is all right if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops for a split second, but otherwise it has problems. And in a way, art since then has been a meditation on all the problems. And in a way, the love of of, of Van Gogh for Japanese art or, or the Cubists, for, it, it's, it's post-perspective people looking at the work of pre-perspective people and feeling a kind of affinity. And so you get that sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that Max Ernst actually saw this piece, but that, but that there's a kind of a, a affinity for them. Uh, it's now come full circle, and in Africa you have this wonderful artist, I forget his name, I have to get his name, who is taking Western objects and turning them back into icons. And, and this is a uh, gasoline, a uh, plastic gasoline uh, container, which is ubiquitous in Africa. And these are big uh, earphones. Uh, and so you get that. Now we are moving along. And the reason two things might look alike is because they have the same cause, which might at times not be initially visible. For example, this is strange. On the left, of course, the famous image from Abu Ghraib. On the right, the, uh, the cemetery uh, for World War I victims of the Battle of the Somme. And they are quite strikingly similar, and the reason, of course, is Christianity in both cases. I mean, this is obviously a crucifixion of this soldier in the trench warfare. That's what's being suggested. And in turn, of course, a resurrection and, and eternal life. Uh, in this case, what's strange is that the Kids who were doing this to this kid, uh, to this guy in, in, uh, in Abu Ghraib, were conflating two parts of the Christ story. They were both the crucifixion, but also the mocking of Christ. You'll remember that they had a wire around his finger, but the wire wasn't actually plugged in, and they were laughing at how freaked out he was. And, and, and. So there's, there's this whole kind of conflation that was happening. I'm not saying that consciously, but they were saturated in that, and, and that came through. So you could say that you get this weird rhyme because they're both kind of drawing on the same causes. Um, it shows up in nature where the same strategy will be used across all the different phyla. So you'll have flight showing up in birds and mammals and, and insects. Uh, it turns out, by the way, that the coffee cup is not a case of apophenia at all. There's a wonderful book by a physicist named Sidney Perkowitz called Universal Foam from Cappuccino to the Cosmos. And it turns out that 
the reason that is doing that is exactly the same reason the Milky Way is doing it and, 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 and so forth. And that, that the reason you get cells that look like that and they don't look like squares or something, there are various physical laws that are, being, uh, that are happening. Under this category of co-causation, there are some particular types. There's fractalization, which is why every single uh, arm of a snowflake re recapitulates the wider arm and the branch is like an arm and the branch is like an arm and so forth. That's called mathematically fractalization. It's why the microscopic image of two uh, pebbles of sand looks exactly like the telescopic image of one of the moons of Mars. It helps explain this thing here. Does anybody know what that is? What do you think that is? What? I just kidding. Frost on glass is one idea. Some people say algae uh, or some uh, fern or something. What this is, is uh, if you take a piece of lucite, just a, a rectangle of lucite, to your, to your nearest linear accelerator, and I urge you to do it, and you zap it, uh, what will happen is that the lucite will con become super saturated with stray electrons, which is to say there is literally not room for one more stray electron, and they are all dying to get out, but they can't because lucite is an insulator. But if you take a hammer, flip it upside down on this image, and you put a nail and you hit it, all of them will instantaneously erupt out in a lightning bolt, and they will self-organize into this pattern as they do so. This is billions and billions and billions of stray electrons rushing out and self-organizing into that pattern. Uh, if you... Uh, Poor guy who hit the nail, did he get... No, 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 it's, it's, it's a little minor thing. You hear a pop, and, and it happens. And if you don't want to do that, I, I, you know, you people look pretty lazy. You're not the kind who are going to go to linear accelerators, I can tell. But anyway, you can go to teslamania.com, and you can buy this thing, for example, which is about this size here, for about $95. There are people who do the work for you. This is the problem in America. There's no initiative anymore. Anyway. <laughs> But the point is that that in turn explains why these things look like these things. That when you see a tree, the energy, the electrical flow, sets up the things that both branches, but within the branches, the leaves, that is the, the, the electricity of life is happening. Now that's in turn why the brain looks like that. Uh, branching and trees and branching, you see it everywhere. An interesting question, though, is, is it because the brain looks like that that we ourselves can't help but think conceptually in terms of trees all the time? Should I do this or should I do this? The genealogical tree, the, you know, all these kinds of tree things that you see constantly. Is it because we have brains and in some way project them out that way? Is that how we are, can't help but see the world? Is that why when, Matt, when Andrew Reinhardt does the, family, the genealogical tree of modernism, you can't really see it here, but... Uh, Matisse, Picasso, Brock, and they all go into different branches and so forth. Or this is Beth Campbell. Do you know this artist? She's terrific. She, she'll go to a gallery and she'll sh set up shop during the show and she'll think about something and in pencil on the wall she'll begin to do a decision tree about whether she should do something or not. And that's the show. It goes on for weeks while she's... In this case, she was trying to decide whether to be a lesbian or not. If I do, they don't like me. They like me. They do like me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, um, so there's that kind of co-causation. Uh, then there's simultaneity as a kind of co-causation, which is why Leibniz and, and, uh, and Newton discover the calculus simultaneously. It is because Europe was super saturated with the idea of the calculus. There was not room for one more idea, and it erupts simultaneously in two different places. The same thing happens with Darwin and Wallace, who simultaneously come up with evolution, at a point where Europe is just one idea away from it happening, and then it happens in two places, and oddly enough, there are the images of a tree, the tree of life. Uh, so you get that phenomenon. Another example of co-causation is identity. And that's, I don't know if you can really see that. This is the phenomenon of floaters. You know when you go outside, it's a nice day, and you're out there in the Nasher Park, and you're on your back, and you're looking up at the sky, and you see those little floaters floating around. And they look like kind of microscopic cells, and they're floating, and you kind of move your eye, and they float this way, and then you kind of move away, and you try and get them back, and you know, you know what I mean? Those are called floaters. And they look like microscopic 
cells. That's an early photograph of microscopic cells. And the reason they do is because they are microscopic cells. They are dead cells inside your eyeball. And because of the optics of your uh, of seeing, you are seeing microscopically before the invention of microscopes. And indeed, when Lohenhock first looked through a microscope and tried to explain to people what he was seeing, he said, you know when you go outside and you look up at the sky? And they were indeed. It turns out that, that's what, that it's possible to see microscopic cells uh, without any equipment. On the other side, you get Percival Lovell, the billionaire philanthropist uh, astronomy buff, who was absolutely convinced that looking through his backyard telescope, he could see canals on Mars and drew pictures of them. Um, and uh, he, in turn, in, he was like Carnegie for astronomy. He endowed level telescopes all over the world, which today bear his name. Uh, but in fact, what's probably happening was that, and this sometimes happens if you look through a, a, a telescope, you, it, it flips on you and it becomes like an ophthalmoscope, and you see the inside of your eye, there's a moment where you, and what's happening is that indeed, it's it, the lenses flip on you and you are seeing the inside of your eye exactly the way your doctor does when he shines, at your physical, he shines a light into your eye. He doesn't care about your eyesight. It happens to be able to see the, the veins, uh, the structure of blood vessels, and veins, and if they are too pronounced, it's an early indication that you might get a stroke of the kind that killed Percival Lovell when he was 52 years old. Oh yeah, this, this well, okay, I'll tell the story. This, is, uh, this was one of my first pieces of reportage when I was a rookie, a cub reporter. I went back to my kindergarten, LeMay Street School in the Valley in Los Angeles, and I was just curious what was passing for for humor with uh, kindergartners. And you could never do this today, but I went, I just went onto the playground and sat around talking to the kindergartners for like two days. Uh, can you imagine doing that, trying to do that? Uh, and the astonishing thing was that the jokes were exactly the same jokes as when I was there, told with exactly the same cluelessness. You know, these kindergartners say, you know, uh, I know one, I know one. Uh, Sally's talking to her mother, Mommy, Mommy, I made a dollar. How did you make a dollar, dear? Uh, the boys bet me that I wouldn't climb the pole, but I did. Oh, silly, they just wanted to see your underwear. Well, I fooled them. I wasn't wearing any. <laughs> when a five-year-old tells you that joke, it cracks up laughing. It's really funny. But, but it suddenly occurred to me that maybe it's the jokes that live at LeMay Street School Playground. And, and there's just this kind of river of people that go through, and, and the real life form are those jokes. Um, here's an interesting thing. This is a iPhoto, uh, iPhone photo of a McDonald's, in a, a, a very kind of trendy McDonald's uh, in, in Brooklyn, where they have these beautiful uh, pictures on the wall that look exactly like uh, Rothko's on their side, because they are Rothko's on their side. <laughs> This is what I mean by identity, you know, the, it looks like it is because it is the thing. Then you get the phenomenon of zeitgeist, uh, who knows why there's all this vampire stuff at once, but uh, I, actually there's been all kinds of PhDs already written on this subject. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about zeitgeist is you often get a, a, a vanilla and a spicy flavor of the same thing whenever it happens. So you'll get the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, you'll get uh, Prince and Michael Jackson, You'll get Sidney Lauper and Madonna. You, this happens in politics as well. You'll get Malcolm X and, and, and uh, Martin Luther King. It, it, very, very often you'll get, it, it, right now we're having a kind of interesting thing with uh, Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin. You, you get these kind of matched. Uh, I'm not sure which way that one goes, by the way. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so anyway, now we're, now we're moving away from uh, things happening in the world to things happening inside the artists themselves and, and when artists relate to each other. So now we're going to direct influence and that can be both backward and forward. So that for example, uh, Dante famously invokes uh, Virgil. And we talk about Virgil's influence on Dante. Uh, but it's also the case, as Eliot pointed out, that nowadays we have Dante's influence on Virgil. It's impossible to read Virgil without having Dante the great, great gravitational forces, Milton, Dante, Shakespeare, and so forth, exert an influence that warps what, what came before them, and so they have, in, it's backward influence. 
An interesting example of that, by the way, a very strange historical one, is Socrates and Jesus. Any of you who remember your college reading of, of The Last Days of Socrates, it's an uncanny story because in both cases you have a kind of democratic assembly that has voted to, has demanded the execution of, of the figure. In, uh, the, in both cases, they have a chance to escape. They don't have to necessarily go through with it. They choose not to, and they're executed and, and so forth. Um, and an interesting question is uh, what the relationship of these two stories is, how they relate to each other. Is it possibly, the, is it just a coincidence, or is it the case that Christianity especially uh, appealed to intellectuals uh, in the first several centuries of existence. And of all the wonder religions that were going on in Palestine, think about Palestine at that moment, it's the intersection of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, it is after Alexander the Great, so you're beginning to have all these local cults that are bumping up against each other. Ju Judaism is going up to Greece, uh, all kinds of things that, that used to be local are now spreading everywhere. And is it the case that that of all those wonder religions that were alive then, the one that rhymed most with the Socrates myth, which all these, all these intellectuals knew, was the one that they were drawn to, and that gave, uh, gave the Jesus story a head start. Or flipping it around, is it the case that during the Middle Ages, of all the philosophers of Attic, of, of Greece, from uh, of which there were an incredible profusion in the fourth and fifth century BC, is Plato the one and Socrates the one that the uh, m monks in the Middle Ages prize the most and bring forward the most because it reminds them of the Jesus story? I mean, it can go either way. Uh, it is interesting that uh, in, uh, on, uh, uh, during the Black Night of the Soul, when Jesus goes off uh, uh, to, to convene with God while, they, while his disciples are asleep in the garden, he uses the phrase, please God, let this cup pass me by. There is no cup in the story. The cup is the cup of hemlock that Socrates drank. So it's a, it's a kind of strange thing going on there. But that's an example of forward and backward. You then also have conscious and unconscious direct influence. The reason Kurt Vonnegut looks like Mark Twain is that he consciously patted himself on Mark Twain. Uh, you have apprenticeship. Uh, there was a show at the Getty a while back on Rembrandt and his pupils, and it was just this connoisseurship extravaganza where you had all these pictures that looked exactly the same, and some of them were Rembrandt's, and some were Rembrandt's pupils, and some were this pupil, and some were this other pupil, and it was quite amazing to watch, and the reason they looked like each other is it was an apprenticeship that was taking place, and, and it's not surprising. In, the, in my own case, my grandfather was a composer, Ernst Toch, uh, as you can see, he's my grandfather, uh, and uh, and he apprenticed himself as a child to Mozart in the sense that he copied out Mozart's string quartets. For years and years, he would just copy them out and, and, and would always say that, he was, that his teacher was Mozart. And indeed, there is a kind of, although he's a modernist, there's a kind of classicism that you see. Another version of, of direct in conscious influence is, is the question of template. And here I want to go back to this thing here. Watch this. This happens all the time, all the time in Disney movies. Watch, this is going to blow your mind. We have Winnie the Pooh on the left uh, and uh, the Jungle Story on the right. All the princess stories uh, have Snow White scenes in them. Snow White set the template for how certain kinds of hugs would happen and so forth. Um, and this is an evil, I think. This is, this is a way of, of uh, that in, you know, doing work. This, by the way, happens in, in San Marco with Fra Angelico, who, if you go to the, wall, the line of the novices, it's always... To make a okay, right. uh, if you... Uh, I mean, it, it continues for a whole, like, a minute and a half. Uh, in Fra Angelico, it's the same crucifixion over and over again with different kinds of things happening at the bottom. Uh, in a second, you'll see, uh, yeah, it's, uh, again, um, the Jungle Book. In a second, you're going to see, this is uh, Wind in the Willows in the Jungle Book. Well, it's not laziness, it's template. And that's, I mean, that's one of the, that's intellectual property is what that is. 
that is uh, that is how Disney is able to do what Disney was able to do. Um, anyway, so that's that's what that's another example of of direct influence in this case. Uh, let's see, how do I get back to where I was? Okay. And by the way, sometimes this creeps into the world. Uh, so how do you account for that? And I think the way you account for it is that, you know, Kate Middleton, growing up on stories of becoming a princess, knows what a princess should look like. <laughs> and anyway, another example of, of, a final example of conscious direct influence is the case of permission. When Bob Dylan does Blonde on Blonde, it suddenly gives, it's outrageous, it's a scandal, he goes electric, guitar but it gives permission to all kinds of other folk singers to start using electric guitar, and it also gives permission to all kinds of electric guitarists to start doing socially conscious lyrics in both directions. And, and, and it's not that he influences exactly, but he kind of allows it, and, and so that is that. Now, if you look at from the other side, there's unconscious direct influence. For example, there's this famous image. Che Guevara has, been, uh, has just been killed, uh, and I remember years ago, uh, John Berger, uh, I, I, when this picture happened in 1967, Che is on his, uh, on his plinth there after he's been killed. And John Berger, the great critic, writes, we all know what this photograph is based on. The image as if hot-wired in their brain, which taught the generals where to stand and taught the photographer where to take the picture from. This is obviously based on the anatomy lesson. I remember when I read that, I said, God, this guy does not read the newspaper the way I read the newspaper. But this is a really cool way to read the newspaper. Um, you then get the phenomenon of guilty conscience. What do you make of this? On the left, a Nazi poster exhorting people to have more babies and the family values and so forth. And then Putin and his party in Russia are facing the same problem in which there's a huge decline in birth rate in Russia. So he has a poster advocating people to have more babies and, and have family values. Now, here you have a situation, is it Google? So somebody Googled family values more babies and came up with that image and just used it? Or is it subversive? Is the guy who did this saying, you know, God, this feels like Nazi Germany? Or is, that, or is there just kind of a guilty conscience floating here? I'm not sure. Another kind of unconscious influence is the anxiety of influence. So a fascinating thing is that the artist David Hockney, who, the artist who, who most influences David Hockney without any doubt is Matisse. It's that same love of bourgeois pleasure uh, and so forth. David Hockney never, ever, ever talks about Matisse. Uh, he paints him over and over again and, and the feeling of Matisse's, but he never talks about Matisse. And that's something that's, that Harold Bloom has called the anxiety of influence. There's just so much gravitational pull that you don't even think about. It. In my own case, I have, I'm fascinated by Freud. I have no interest in Carl Jung. I have no idea what Carl Jung is talking about. It doesn't interest me at all. People keep on saying, well, you would find this interesting. I just don't, I don't, I don't even look at it. Um, anyway, so now we're going to go from influence to where something's more active. And now we're talking about illusion. And illusion takes the form of different kinds. There's invocation. So, for example, there's no doubt that Rembrandt in that famous painting is invoking the deposition of Christ. There's various paintings like this, Montaigne in this case. Uh, I think that, by the way, explains why this happens that, uh, again, I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking purely about the way that images prepare the way for other images prepare the way for other images. If the day Che had died, he hadn't looked like that, I don't think you would have, through Rembrandt into Montaigne, have gotten this kind of iconic image of this Christ-like figure who, although seemingly dead, will rise again. If he had, for example, looked like this guy here, does anybody know who that is? My favorite, somebody said Desi Arnaz, which I thought was pretty good. But, that's Che Guevara. Uh, his passport photo disguised as an Argentinian businessman that allowed him to go to, uh, to uh, Africa. If he had looked like that the day he died, it just, none of this stuff would have happened, I guarantee you. Another example of that sort of thing is this, which is the famous painting by Goya of uh, the 3rd of May. Uh, the Napoleonic troops have entered Madrid, and they're now killing off the, the defenders of Madrid a horrifying thing that happened, and you have French soldiers killing Spaniards, again, by the way, a kind of Christian uh, 
some, uh, some Christian stuff going on over here. Uh, but then, 50 years later, when Napoleon's, Napoleon III uh, sends his representative to become the, uh, the emperor of Mexico, Maximilian, and the Me Mexicans rise up and eventually kill Maximilian, you now, here you had French killing Spanish speakers, here you have Spanish speakers killing French, and Manet, on the spur of the moment, with Berger-like uh, uh, perspicacity, says, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of this, and is able to put it in the picture. Uh, again, there's a Christian thing going on with the halo flanked on either side, but they're obviously, uh, invo that Manet is invoking uh, the example of Goya. You can get homage. So I told you a second ago that David Hockney never ever talks about Matisse. All he ever talks about is Picasso. He has a picture of himself as a young boy naked with his master there. He over and over again will do pictures that are clearly homages to uh, Picasso. And just the other day he sent me, uh, he was at a Picasso show and he sent me an eye photo where it turns out that Picasso, like him, was a smoker. Don't get David Hockney started on smoking. Um, it, it, David Hockney's intellectual screensaver, you know, isn't like an aquarium. He, he, he's really thinking all the time, but when he turns the m mind off, he falls into this, this British crank, uh, endlessly talking about how the rights of smokers are being violated, and it's just gotten terrible, and it's, it's a tyranny, and it's a da-da, and, and it's gotten to the point where people like me who hang out with him, we don't even pay any attention, so he gets more and more he ups the ante constantly, and I was with my daughter with him, and some of the people, we were at a Chinese restaurant, and some of his staff, and me, and my daughter, and him, and he was just jabber, yammering on about the rights of smokers, and he said, you know, it's gotten to be like the Holocaust. <laughs> and my daughter looked at him and said, David, you're insane. And the, all of, the rest of us kind of looked at us, our, each other sheepishly, because we'd allowed it to get to this point, you know, but just because we're not paying attention anymore, but, but uh, anyway. Uh, so I'm using this, that, that, uh, that David is always in homage to Picasso, in much the way this whole lecture is my own homage to John Berger, uh, the great critic. Uh, similarly, under illusion, you get pun, so that people who saw the movie, uh, uh, you know, Spider-Man had that little sequence happen, and it was obviously they were punning on the Passion of the Christ, in the same way that in MASH you had that, se that scene where it suddenly became the Last Supper. Then you get another category, which is pastiche. I was at the Prado uh, a few months ago, and at a, uh, that week, uh, a magazine had on its back cover this ad. And the thing that's funny about this, by the way, is pastiche often teaches you something about the original. In this case, you know, there are endless things have been written about Las Maninas, but the, but the basic premise is that he's got this painting which is basically the same size as the final painting in relationship to his own standing figure, uh, and there he is. And the implication is that he's looking in a mirror to get what all these people look like, but then as a kind of uh, final joke or final thing, he, he makes it seem as if the king and the queen are standing there and that you see them in that mirror back there. There's all that kind of stuff uh, going on. However, of course, in reality, this never happened. There was never a moment where he was standing painting like this. He spent, you know, a week painting that dog. And then he had another model stand there for, for however long, and then he had another one. And I, I wonder seriously whether, whether people didn't realize this before the invention of photography. That, the, that in the days before photography, you were, would have read a painting as if it were a novel you would have looked around at knowing in the same way that a novel is an entire story, but it has to be unfolded slowly and so forth. You would have known that he painted this and then he painted this and then he painted this and, and it come, becomes a story as it is constructed. And we only think about it the other way because we think of photo we see photographs all the time, such as this one here, which was in fact done exactly that way. That is a camera looking in a mirror, you know, and you could imagine that that's what, what, what happened there. You get a similar thing with David LaChapelle recently has been doing, uh, this is a Dutch still life. This is a David LaChapelle, you can see the, the phones down here. Of course, the thing about this is that this bouquet never existed. If it had, it would have wilted before it could have been painted. They were painted one flower at a time and turned into a bouquet over time. Conversely, this one does exist and they had to have wilted ones in it to give the feeling of what you get in this thing. Uh, uh, so, 
So you get that kind of thing in pastiche. You then get parody going relatively quickly here. You had the famous moment where the nation made fun of, of George Bush. Uh, instead of what be worry, it was worry. This really rankled Republicans who then, uh, when Obama was running, had a poster of the nation. If Obama was a Republican, this was what the nation would look like. Somebody else took the famous uh, Shepard Farley and instead of having hope, did that. And then it wants the inauguration to have a Mad Magazine had to get in on the act too and, and they did their own cover. Sometimes you get quotation. Herman Melville when he writes Moby Dick. It's not for nothing, it's clearly he has been reading King James Bible and he's been reading Shakespeare. And, and it, it's just man absolutely on fire who has been consuming these incredible things and huge gollops of it show up almost in quotes in, 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 in Moby Dick. Uh, similarly, uh, the famous picture by Velasquez of the spinners, this is actually the story of Ariadne. Ariadne has made a bet with, um, with Athena that she, she's such a good uh, uh, weaver. She says, I'm better than Athena. Athena shows up. She says, oh yeah, I want to make Macbeth. Uh, and they both agree to weave uh, uh, things. It's always on the theme of the gods and man. Uh, the one that she chooses, Ariadne does this incredible thing of Europa being carried off by a bull. Uh, and it is, is in fact better than Athena's. And Athena in her rage turns Ariadne into a spider. This is the scene where, Ar where Athena is becoming furious because Ariadne right there is displaying her thing. The thing, if you saw it in the, is that painting by Titian a hundred years earlier. He is quoting, Velasquez quotes the painting inside as if to say, I can do better than Titian. Uh, so, I mean, you can, it's bad, you can hardly see it, but it's back there. Anyway, now we get to appropriation. And the famous instance is, is, uh, Andy Warhol, who just appropriates a Campbell suit can. I would argue, by the way, this is Andy Warhol's Rothko, if you think about it. Uh, and in fact, not, he, is, he is stealing, he is appropriating the entire gesture of Duchamp. So not only is he appropriating Brillo pads and saying this is art because I say it's art, but he is also appropriating the fact that Duchamp had done that in what is arguably the most important, just, there was a recently, a few years ago, what's the most significant work of the 20th century and people voted for this. Uh, this is often misconstrued. People say that what he did, Duchamp just took a urinal and put it on a pedestal and said, uh, this is, signed it and said this is art. And that was a huge scandal. In fact, he didn't do that. He did something far more interesting. And it, you can see it when you see Edward Steichen who was asked to photograph it by Duchamp, photographed it like that. And it really is, it's Buddha, it's a Madonna, it's a Pieta, it really does. A urinal is turned into not only, he has noticed something about urinals by putting it flat and not on the wall. It's actually a very complicated thing he did. Uh, I put these two side by side because about five years ago, a man attacked the, urine, uh, the fountain as it's called uh, in Nîmes in France with a hammer. Uh, you know, act of de uh, desecration that was similar to what happened to the Pieta 50 years ago or so. Uh, in the case of the Pieta, a uh, guy named Laszlo Toth attacked, uh, attacked the Pieta in the Vatican with a hammer, yelling, I think, no, no more masterpieces or something was, was his, it was some kind of anarchist thing. Uh, there was a great cartoon, not a cartoon, but a photograph in the Harvard Lampoon of, a, of, of Laszlo Toth at the moment he was hitting it, uh, it was captured by somebody, and, and the caption was, oh my God, Pieta, I thought it said pinata. Uh, <laughs> but the th crazy thing about this was, this guy was put on trial, and it turned out he was a day patient from the institution in Saint-Rémy, which is where Van Gogh had been in the same asylum, and it turned out it was not the first time he'd attacked this piece. He had attacked it eight years earlier when it was on display in the Pompidou Center in what to my mind is the single greatest act of performance art of the 20th century. He had peed into it. <laughs> and before the judge, his excuse for having hit it with a hammer was that once he had peed into it, he had reminded it of its true nature, which was to be practical, to be a pissoir, and that ever since then it had existed in agony of confusion when people looked at it as art, and he was trying to put it out of its pain. <laughs> anyway, 
so you get Sherry Levine doing her version, Liza Liu does her version down there, um, and then you get to Kryptonesia. Kryptonesia, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit here, but Kryptonesia is a wonderful thing. Kryptonesia is when people appropriate other people's work without realizing they've done so. Uh, Brian Friel, who someday is going to win the Nobel Prize, one of the greatest playwrights of our time, in this play, Molly Sweeney, has entire paragraphs that he has lifted word for word from Oliver Sacks, unbeknownst to himself. He denied it completely. But it's there. I mean, it's there on the page. It's one year later, and there's entire passages that are, uh, I, if you want, later on I can describe to you how it happened. But, but uh, it happens all the time. It's very, very interesting, especially to people like Oliver Sacks and Kapuscinski, who are very vivid writers. They make a real imprint on other people and so forth. So now finally we're getting to plagiarism, and you can get the example of forgery. Uh, famously, this, this, uh, there's a whole story that goes with this. I won't tell it, but it's, uh, this, is Vermeer, uh, this is a forgery of Vermeer in the 1930s. What's fascinating about this is it doesn't look at all like Vermeer. It looks exactly like Vermeer looked in the 1930s. In the 1930s, this is what people came to Vermeer for. And it's interesting about forgeries, they often date that they are hard to see at the time they're made, but as years pass, you can see better. There's a whole thing that goes there. And then you get to counterfeiture, right? So the reason that $100 bill looks like a $100 bill is because it is made to look like a $100 bill. Those look like Gucci bags because of that. So a coda to all this. In um, 1903, Helen Keller publishes The Story of My Life. It's an instantaneous bestseller, this deaf, dumb, blind woman has created this astonishing memoir. And six months later, she's accused of plagiarism. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Helen Keller is accused of plagiarism. Now let's stop for a second and think about it. Because every experience Helen Keller ever had was mediated through work language. When she was standing in front of the, Mida, uh, the Matterhorn, she either read in Braille or had hand read to her uh, the Baedeker on the Matterhorn. And she experienced it with great vividness through those words. And she had a great memory, so that when she then described standing in front of the Matterhorn, it was word for word what had been read to her, and that was her experience. In any case, she was thrown into a terrible depression and Mark Twain, bless his heart, sent her a wonderful, wonderful letter, which I wanted to quote from. I urge you to read the whole thing. It's if you go to Google, plagiarism, Helen Keller, Mark Twain. Anyway, oh dear me, how unspeakably funny and owlishly idiotic and grotesque was that whole plagiarism farce. As if there was much of anything in any human utterance, oral or written, except plagiarism. The kernel, the soul, let us go further and say the substance, the bulk, the actual and valuable material of all human utterance is plagiarism. For substantially all ideas are secondhand, consciously or unconsciously drawn from a million outside sources and daily used by the garnerer with a pride and satisfaction born of the superstition that he originated them. Whereas there is not a rag of originality about them anywhere except in the little discoloration they get from his mental and moral caliber and his temperament, which is revealed in characteristics of phrasing. Isn't that fantastic? Anyway, so now where are we? Where does this put us all in the context of the thing that got us going here? Um, well, we may be dealing with apophenia, or even leapfrogging apophenia in this case, as I, do, as I too have begun to buy into Mr. Morrison's, Morris's assertion that there's something's going on here. If it's not apophenia, it may simply be coincidence, but I, but I suspect it's more. It may be conscious illusion on officials' part, or else an instance of unconscious influence, bad, uncouth men simply reeking of a certain rank, fire-snorting dragonhood across time and across culture. The nice thing in this instance is that Master Fischel is still around, and we could ask him. And when I was giving this lecture in New York a few months ago, he was in the audience. <laughs> it was just like that scene in, in Annie Hall where the guy's going on and about Marshall McLuhan, and Marshall McLuhan's in the, in the line. He says, you don't understand my work at all. Anyway, uh, and Fischel denied knowing about this painting. On the other hand, 
The nice thing about convergences is that it really doesn't matter whether the artist intended the echo in question, consciously or unconsciously. The artist being, as Diderot said, merely the first witness of the completed painting and in the end capable of claiming no greater status than that. After him, there will be further witnesses, all the rest of us, all of us equally privileged viewers by virtue of the fact that we have all drawn equally and are equally bathed in the confluence of cross currents that is the wider cultural surround. Convergence in that sense being nothing less than another name for culture itself. Or as a friend of mine told me about a year ago, quoting somebody, she couldn't quite remember who it was she was quoting, she thought it might be Ezra Pound. Culture begins when we forget our sources. Thank you. So, uh, questions, she, there's a question over here. Here comes a microphone, so just a second, apparently. <laughs> Yeah. No, I know. That's how it is. Uh, it's even funnier than that. It's even funnier than that. And if you go online, uh, at, th at the Hammer Museum, uh, Annie Philbin had the idea to show Jung's Red Book, the actual object, which was like a fantastically great idea from curatorial side. And there were just lines around the corn over, but she wanted to give it a little intellectual heft. And so she had a series of 10 conversations between a Jungian and a non-Jungian over a period of consecutive weeks. And I was the first one, and I was talking to a guy who was the head of humanities at some Jungian university, Pacific Grove or something. And it's online. And it, 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 I think it's the single greatest performance I ever had. I mean, because of degree of difficulty. I mean, the entire audience was Jungians. And, and this guy, and I think the Red Book is nonsense myself, and, and this guy just was incredibly entranced, and the audience was totally entranced, and at one point he says, he says, you know, I've now read it three times, and I can't say I understand it, but I'm remaining, uh, he had some great phrase, it wasn't open, I'm, rema I'm remaining porous to it. And I said, how is that for you to remain porous to it like that? You know? and, and, and then he read a passage and he said, you know, this is poetry. I said, no, it's not poetry. This is poetry. And I read something. And, but the point is that I kept on reading examples that were really, really cool. And the audience by then was just loving me, thinking I was a Jungian. But I'm not a Jungian. I, I, I think it's kind of, it was really, so it's worth looking at. It's because it's just because it's, it's really funny, the situation that I'm in in that, in that conversation. Other things? Yes. Yeah. First off, I thought this was one of the most brilliant lectures I've heard in a very, very long time. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't believe, though, that you didn't take the Iwo Jima, the raising of the cross, right. and then go to the next level with the mushroom crowd, you know, the outcome of the change of the old world dying, sure. and obviously the new world beginning, right. and that being the resurrection. Well, there's that, and there's also the cross-like shape of the mushroom cloud, which is strange. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Well, you see, this is why this lecture gets longer and longer. <laughs> this used to be a lecture that people weren't walking out of in the middle, but, but, uh, but, but, I mean, how can I not include Bigfoot on the solar, f I mean, you just got to include it, and now I'm going to have to include that, and it's just, you know, this is, uh, this is how this happens, but no, that's very interesting, yeah. And, it's, and, and that in turn moves on in all sorts of directions. And, hmm, thank you. Uh-oh. Uh, I'll say in Dallas, this is what they think about things. But, uh, thank you. Other thoughts? Well, listen, thank you so much. And I guess we're doing this. And I'll sign books if you want upstairs. And, uh,